you everybody for coming back to what is already the final panel of the conference days of Data Cities. And I'm very happy to be moderating the panel with you today. It's uh, on Citizens for Digital Sovereignty, Shaping Inclusive and Resilient Cities. And I'm joined by Elisabeth calderon luning Raphael Heiber, and Alexander Monin, who's joining us via video today. So as we already experienced, not all our speakers, unfortunately, could be with us here today. As Alexander is joining us uh, via video, and also Fika Janse, who is originally supposed to moderate the panel. Unfortunately, she wasn't able to travel here because also now where she lives has been declared a, a risk area. But well, my name is Lika, so I hope from Fika to Lika won't be a too big of a change. So um, yeah. Uh, we're really happy to have this final panel at the conference to focus on more concrete proposals, how we can make a change in the cities of the future and what we can do to empower citizens. And this is with a special focus also on uh, the term digital sovereignty, which Elizabeth, I really liked how you described it in one of the abstracts as getting in the driver's seat of our digital futures. So um, yeah, Elizabeth will be our first speaker in the panel. And she's an associate researcher at the Weizenbaum Institute for the Networked Society. And there she is part of the research group Inequality and Digital Sovereignty with Berlin University of the Arts. And her research, which actually today she will be speaking on on stage for the first time, which is very exciting. Uh, her research is focused on democratic deliberation in digital urban policy and digital sovereignty. Um, she's also the co-initiator of the Digital City Alliance Berlin and there she advocates for broadening the public conversation on digital transformation and fostering digital policy towards public good. So we will start with the talk of Elisabeth and then moving on to the other panelists. So the floor is yours. Thank you. I'm going to see if I can get this started. No. Okay, it feels really um, interesting to talk directly after the last session because um, these were very big and very in-depth uh, global questions and uh, now we're going to zoom into a very specific context of Berlin um, and some things that are happening here especially about uh, participation in digital policy making and how it's being tested and tried here in the city. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to be talking about some things, as Lika said, from my current research, and it is very uh, exciting and nerve-wracking <laughs> to do that for the first time. Um, as part of my, from my research from the um, research group Inequality and Digital Sovereignty at the Weizenbaum Institute, but also, um, as Liki mentioned, from the network that I'm part of, with, which is a civil society and academic uh, network trying to influence digital policy making here in Berlin. Um, I'm going to start, however, with my past work um, because it influences a lot why I'm researching the way I am right now and uh, why these questions are important to me. I'm wondering if I could take this off here <laughs> and move, move my computer up to my lap to get it a little bit closer to me. Can you take the microphone? Sorry, is that okay? <laughs> yeah, perfect. Um, Great, thank you. So before my academic research, I have been working um, in Berlin for about 10 years doing very other things. Um, I've been building urban gardens and organizing local participation in city planning and city politics and setting up um, self-organized learning spaces and um, knowledge exchange in neighborhoods here in Berlin. My engagement was and still is very much focused on civic participation and urban development. So digital politics or technology in general wasn't something that I was very engaged with uh, at that time. So my issues were more on um, environmental and climate justice, on housing rights, and around the question of what kind of city we need to build for the next 10 or 50 or 100 years from now. 
and I co-founded an organization called Common Grounds, uh, and we had the possibility to join a EU-funded research uh, project called Mazi in 2016. Uh, Mazi means together in Greek, and the idea with the project was that we're experimenting with local digital networks or community networking, or also called DIY digital networks, together with communities that are usually not engaged with technology or specifically not engaged uh, in technology development. And the, the Mazi project was stretched over several cities in Europe, um, but here in Berlin we were working together with the University of the Arts, um, and working with communities that were closely connected to common grounds. So we were working with uh, city activist groups, uh, neighborhood sites like the Prinzessinnen Garden, which is very close by here, and family centers. And the questions that we were asking these projects was, what does technology look like when we develop it and conceive it from a very local context? So what can neighborhood technology be? And how can we create how can we manage to make technology development something collaborative in these kinds of, of uh, situations? And it wasn't easy to bring something like so, so abstract like technology into spaces that are usually managing very concrete issues like who, who is getting displaced from their communities or um, which um, local little stores have to close down um, because they're the city is not allowing them to, to survive, or that the, the planet is getting hotter and we keep on putting um, concrete on every um, piece of open soil. But throughout the project, it became apparent that these issues that we were working with, so these uh, issues about property and ownership of land and real estate, or questions of management, who is deciding what is a livable city and who is decide, deciding who gets to live where, that these topics connect a lot to topics when we, when we talk about technology. So we're seeing here also talking about property and ownership of digital infrastructures, of software, and of course of data, or the governance of these technologies. So for what purposes are they being made and um, who profits from them and who is included in these systems and who is excluded. But we have a really long history and a lot of practice with, within urban movements to protest for tenant rights or inclusive housing policy or creating spaces in local communities where we can engage with these issues. But when it comes to technology, we're still pretty much at the beginning also as what, what we heard in, uh, uh, in the talks beforehand. We're still waking up um, and becoming aware of how technology is changing our social fabric, that the logic behind technology production today is foremost based on economic growth and profit, and that while we use digital technologies, our data and our interactions are being commodified and that we have little to say about any of these issues. So we might feel comfortable and we might understand um, when we speak about right to housing or right to the city movement, or we understand slogans like die Häuser, die drin wohnen, which means the houses for them who live in them. But how do we engage in the same way when it comes to digital transformation? On the one hand, we need to develop critical awareness of the role of technology in our lives. But on the other hand, on an individual level, we have very little leverage when it comes to changing any of, it, any of it. We could see this, for example, when the GDPR was introduced, so the General Data Protection Regulation, that even when we had this law in our, like, that was backing us up, um, the actual task of protecting our data was left to us when, as individuals. So when we, have, when, we, when we have to accept cookies or trackers on apps or, or websites, which most of, we, most of us probably just do, just to get on with everything. So the responsibility cannot be put on an individual level. We need... It's supposed to be black. <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> Everybody's freaking out in the table, like, ah, sorry. <laughs> um, we need policy infrastructures that let us articulate as a society, as a collective. We need government to take on these tasks with us. 
So after the MAZI project, I had the possibility to keep on researching in this field together with the research group that has been mentioned at the Weizenbaum Institute. And I'm currently looking at digital politics in Berlin and how it's being made and structured. And of course, my focus here as well lies on civic participation. So the question is, under what premises and in what spaces is civic participation in digital policy being configured? And how is the Berlin government currently defining its role uh, in these processes and in its role as shaping uh, technology? And I want to halt here for a little bit because I want to address the concept of digital sovereignty. And this is a concept that has been percolating uh, for a while now within digital policy making and it's also a focus of the research group. And I'm trying to see if this concept can be helpful in building dif different digital governance structures also within cities. Now it's a picture. So digital sovereignty has, has long been focused on the territorial sovereignties of states. We're seeing this, for example, in the US discussions on TikTok and Huawei, where in these cases, the United States is claiming its protection of its territorial and state sovereignty and the sovereignty, sov sovereignty of its people toward another state, in this case, China. Europe is also holding on to this concept seeing that none or hardly any larger technology companies or platforms come from Europe, the EU is using funding programs to kickstart European alternatives or looking at how they can uh, build regulation to inhibit breaches in their sovereignty. And as you hear, there is like a nationalistic undertone in this, in this way that uh, digital sovereignty has been, has been uh, conceived. I'm not going to get into that narrative very much, but, but I think it should be mentioned because I, I think it's also very interesting. But when we're talking about this kind of digital sovereignty, we are talking about geopolitical ownership of relevant and critical infrastructure. So who is owning the cables, for example, which our information is, is moving on, or who develops and owns the software and platforms which we use and which shape all things digital. And of course, the big mighty question of who claims ownership of the data and decides how it's used. And these are really relevant, of course, relevant building blocks for digital sovereignty. But I would like to highlight another um, idea or another perspective of sovereignty and how it implies, applies to the internal life of states. So the relationship between the people of a state, the citizens, to its government. And I think this is an, an interesting focus because uh, you get other questions to the table. So on the one hand, it asks the question of democratic deliberation. So how much are we the people at all involved in shaping the development of our digital futures and how is government ensuring that we the people are heard in these conversations? So this is a sovereignty that is, not, that is of us as societies, not towards or against another society, but towards the technology and itself and the companies that are delivering them to us. I really... Um, like this uh, quote from John Dewey uh, from 1927. I think all historical uh, uh, projections are interesting because it, it, doesn't, it, it lets us feel less alone. Um, the instrumentality or the technology becomes a master and works fatally as if possessed of a will of its own. Not because it has a will, but because man has not. So at that time, he was speaking about um, the technological transformation of the 19th and 20th century. And for him, it was the capacity of society to position themselves in, relationship to, in relation to societal transformation that was crucial to attain any possibility of acting as a sovereign people. And while John Dewey set his hopes to political uh, education and participation, these are not enough to encounter the complexities of the questions facing us today, but it does point to the need for public deliberation and understanding, awareness, if dem democratic sovereignty is to exist under the digital transformation at all. It's black again. Uh, to get back to my question from before, under what premises and in what spaces is civic participation in digital policy being configured and how is the Berlin government currently defining its role? And I'm going to start with the second part. Uh, so what does digital politics look like in Berlin at the moment? And bear with me, I'm a political scientist. I really love this part. I know that it might feel uh, daunting. Um, 
when you see it like this. So this is an organizational diagram of the Senate level of government in Berlin. And this is, of course, just one level of government. Uh, we also have the parliament. We have in Berlin, which is a Berlin-specific thing, we have the 12 sef separate boroughs with administrations that look about just as complicated. And of course, we have um, the publicly owned enterprises as well. So this is already a pretty complicated picture. Um, but if we put all parts of government into here, it would be pretty much unreadable. But when we see this picture, it lets us understand that one, government is really complicated. And two, we need policy coherence because otherwise all of these little uh, administrations are working by themselves and not speaking to each other, which is a fact, uh, for, unfortunately, for much policy making. But for digital poli policy making, it means that uh, on the one hand, it needs a force of its own, so it needs um, a real space in this, not to get, uh, not to just drown away in this entanglement. But it also needs to be embedded in municipal goals and objectives. So it can't be a policy making that's completely separate from all of these administration floating around like a free radical. But it needs to be policy making that is reinforcing other policy objectives within all of these administrations. And right now, digital policy in Berlin is structurally very weak, and, or at least, let's call it weak, and, and at least very scattered. While Hamburg, for, for example, has around 100 people in one central administrative body within the mayor's office, spearheaded by uh, a chief digital officer, uh, Berlin has a dispersed structure, mainly in these three administration, and administrations with little man or woman power and no one steering body, well, steering any kind of overall goal, goals. And this is okay, bearing in mind that Berlin has faced 15 years of uh, austerity and cutbacks, so uh, the Berlin administration has not been able to spend any money to build any kind of capacities to, to hire personnel um, for, the, for the last 15 years. This is just currently changing, but as we all know, to, to take away the negative effects of, of austerity it takes a lot of time to repair. So these are the three Senate administrations that are highlighted uh, and they all have different tasks and objectives within this digital policy. We have uh, the Senate for Internal Affairs, which is basing its work on the e-government strategy from 2015. It is trying to uh, digitalize and centralize the entire municipal administration, which is of course not an easy task because uh, not only is it a whole lot of uh, administrations, but each one of them, uh, and also the boroughs, have been um, working with their own IT solutions for the last 20 years, and now this is trying to be centralized. And then we have the mayor's office, which is leading the initiatives surrounding Smart City, and um, they are also basing their work uh, from a strategy from 2015. But just a couple of weeks ago, um, this administration attained or won a bid to become a model smart city for Germany and is going to receive 17 and a half million euros for renewing the current smart city strategy. And if you want to, we can talk about this a little bit later at the Q&A. And then there's the third, which is the uh, Senate for Economy, Energy and Public Enterprises. And they've been named leader for developing a cohesive digital strategy for Ber Berlin. So, but their work was started last year. So interestingly, this strategy, which is supposed to articulate uh, Berlin's overall digital policy vision for all sectors and administrations, so trying to create some kind of policy coherence, is the last strategy to be made. Uh, I'm not going to try to make any final conclusions because I'm definitely not there in my research, but. Um, what we can see is that digital policy in Berlin has been mostly reacting towards external developments and trends and not really leading the way in uh, any kind of vision for, for a digital transformation. And it's facing a task of creating administrative structures that will allow for intersectional policy making where digital policy is integrated into the municipal objectives and planning. 
and it will have to strengthen this process by building up know-how and personnel resources, which is a really big problem when you speak with any politician or any uh, administrative level people, this is their main concern. Um, what's interesting to mention is that all of these strategy processes as policy nowadays, they have to somehow integrate participation, civic participation, and of course uh, they have them written down uh, in their strategy processes as well. But these are always, or not, or mostly at least just the administrations informing the public possibly of that this strategy is happening or maybe some kind of not really transparent consulting uh, experts on these issues but it's not a, a really open participation but of course civic participation and civic engagement doesn't have to wait for a formal invitation by government here is a picture of an e-scooter that has landed in the, in the Berlin Canal and civic engagement can look like this, of course, where people express their discontent about e-scooters that all of a sudden appear on all uh, pedestrian streets and giving anyone with a s smartphone access to a pretty fast vehicle without uh, any idea how to drive them. Or it can look like this, um, which is protests against how platforms like Airbnb are directly affecting neighborhoods and rental prices. Um, in 2016, Berlin passed a law called Zweckentfremdungsverbot, which prohibits housing to be misused as holiday rentals. The implementation of this law was not very successful. One way could have been to force Airbnb to give data to help enforce this law, but any kind of collaboration in this way has been really slow. Just a couple of weeks ago, the city of Berlin attained some data sets from Airbnb from 2012 to 2000. 2014 to at least search for tax evaders. This is of course uh, a really known example of civic participation uh, from more the, of the civic tech uh, perspective, Freifunk, which builds uh, free networks and internet connectivity throughout Berlin and elsewhere, completely self-organized and on a voluntary basis. It's back. When the Berlin Senate kicked, up, uh, kicked off its digital strategy process last year, we were a small group of people that had been meeting up now and then to discuss the need for a different uh, people's and rights-centered digital policy that works with and for the city. Of course, with inspirations from Barcelona and Amsterdam that were both going through pretty radical digital transformations at the time, we were hoping to find the same energy here in Berlin. But when we saw that the strategy process for the Berlin digital strategy was coordinated and designed by Ernst and & Young, and that the public debate, deliberation, and participation for the strategy process was limited to some stakeholder dialogues or online participations at the end of the process, we decided to open up our group and our conversation. So in June last year, we made an open invitation to come and discuss with us in the Berlin parliament. Uh, it was really great to see that the largest uh, room in the parliament building, except for the plenary, uh, was actually pretty full after just inviting everybody that we knew that could be interested and asking them to invite further. Um, it was people from civil society organizations, uh, of course academics, uh, consumer interest groups, uh, and also tech workers uh, that uh, are, trying to organize as, are trying to organize as a labor force. And that became the kickoff of the Berlin Digital City Alliance. Some months later, we published a statement paper signed by more than 30 organizations from civil society and science demanding a digital strategy fostering sovereignty, sustainability, and policy for the public good. Our main demand was and is the democratization of um, the digital transformation starting with the digital policy making itself. So the demand was to institutionalize public deliberation and participation in its true form. Uh, and this is something that we have reiterated after experiencing the corona lockdown, where the digital realm all of a sudden engulfed all of our lives and the digitalization of everything became very rushed with any kind of uh, discussions beforehand. What we propose is an institutionalized roundtable for digital politics coordinated by civic actors. 
we are talk we're taking inspiration uh, from an already existing example here in Berlin, which is the round table for real estate. And that has been a successful instrument for the last five years for civic realignment of city planning policy here in Berlin. The goal of the round table for uh, digital policy is to find a space First of all, to find a space where all of these uh, administrations are finally in the same room and talk with each other, but also to, bu to build an instrument of public and political deliberation. I can tell more about this as well in the Q&A, but I also want to have, end with some happy uh, or at least inspirational things, because things are moving in Berlin. It's this, it's the Berlin.de website, which is the municipal uh, website and the face of Berlin um, in the internet. But it's, since its beginnings in the mid-1990s, um, been a, managed by a public-private partnership where the content has been managed as a tandem between um, the city itself and a private company that has been making profit through ad advertising and of course uh, collecting data from the website. And sure, it doesn't sound directly super interesting since it's just a website, but we're actually talking about, because what's happening now with this website is that it's being bought back by the city. So it's this private part of the private-public partnership is being take out, taken out. So we're actually talking about uh, Berlin's online presence being put back in citizens' hands. So what can we as a city, as citizens, do with this platform? How can it be managed in partnership with its citizens? And I think this process can become exemplary for building a partnership with the city society and it can be become a model also for testing things like data commoning. It can also become a platform for strengthening public participation in all city administrations but also in digital governance. So civic engagement is strong in Berlin and in the last four years the Berlin government has built, built on this energy and become very progressive not in digital policy but in the specific field of city planning, which uh, I started this conversation on. For the last uh, years, uh, or last year, I mean, um, a five-year rental gap was passed, for example, stopping the rents in Berlin from going up for the next five years, uh, which was a really radical thing in Germany. It's been criticized a lot from, from more conservative um, voices. The city is also buying back housing to be able to regain some agency when it comes to housing justice. Even the word disappropriation, so the renationalization of some housing companies is something that you can hear t being talked about in the Berlin parliament. And I think these are really inspiring examples of, of the housing and, and uh, city activist movement that we can learn from and, and also gain some force and, and agency also when it comes to digital policy. Berlin shows that it can be very progressive and this is what we need also for digital policy making. But I think the most important thing with digital policy making in Berlin is that we have to take this question what kind of a city do we need for the next 10, 50 and 100 years from now? What kind of city do we need to build now? And this quest question has to stand in the forefront before we talk, uh, in the forefront of any kind of digital policy making. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elisabeth, for a great start of this panel and brought up already a lot of questions for me, but I'll hold on to those until the other presentations have been. So I'm happy to introduce the next panelist, which is Raphael Heiber. Um, he's the co-founder and CEO of the Common Action Forum, which is a non-profit organization dedicated to the development of ideas and also a platform to address global challenges. Uh, he studied geography and spatial planning at Sao Paulo University in Brazil. And his areas of specialty included climatology, air pollution and urbanism. And he also later on uh, in Madrid completed advanced studies in culture, communication and knowledge, as well as a PhD in sociology, uh, focusing on issues of technology, mobility, politics, epistemology and citizenship, which I think will also be reflected in the talk today addressing 
issues of mobility and habitability especially. And then also very interesting to mention that he is currently editor-in-chief of Metapolis, which is a newly launched online journal uh, which is proposing ideas that go beyond traditional borders of knowledge and also confront global challenges. So very much looking forward to your talk and thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Lieke. Thank you very much, Tatiana. And uh, I'm very happy to be here at the Disruption Network Lab. It's the first time uh, I'm here, although I met Tatiana uh, in other uh, few occasions. And um, I think now with the presentation, with uh, one detail of this presentation, I might have made now few enemies in this room. Uh, being presented as a CEO of uh, an organization and uh, this is actually a terminology that we try to not to to use for many years but at the end uh, we, we we just accepted that uh, um, here it would work out something different but uh, in other places it automatically uh, uh, named like that but I, before I, ca I, was, I was coming here, I did not realize, and uh, it was just uh, this afternoon, I saw something uh, related to uh, tactics of uh, empowerment, uh, and uh, I was not aware of, of that. Uh, and uh, this has a lot to do with uh, what Elizabeth uh, has, has done, because we are living under a huge strategy of control and uh, the only thing we can do as citizens is just to develop tactics that escape uh, what they cannot appropriate, what uh, they cannot uh, control. Um, before going uh, directly into the topic uh, I would like to talk uh, tonight, uh, I think it's important to emphasize that we have to assume the complexity of all the topics we are trying to analyze, which means uh, there is no easy answer for any question of uh, we are trying to, to pose. And uh, this has uh, a lot to do with uh, the struggles we are facing uh, in our times. Uh, we see everywhere everyone has uh, a way to simplify all the, all the, all, all, all the problems, all the uh, circumstances of our life and uh, we end up not having some kind of uh, common basis to dialogue and to propose uh, any kind of agenda that we can build that would be positive for the majority of uh, the people and of uh, the citizens. Uh, this being told, um, it was said that I am geographer and I am a sociologist. And this is, I think, bad news for you because it means that I am not a specialist on anything. Uh, if you are a geographer, you try to, th to see things in a very horizontal way, uh, differently than, uh, for example, a geologist that goes deep and uh, defines what was uh, uh, under your, your feet. Uh, and uh, we try to connect the elements that uh, can produce the space where we live. And in a very similar way is also sociology, which was actually a not very uh, well recognized, I would say, uh, field of uh, expertise or science, uh, because it's not also dealing with someone that can be easily uh, applied or something that you can really demonstrate. And uh, so we live in a world of specialization, uh, and that's why we are here now, we can use a microphone, we can use a computer because there were uh, brilliant minds that worked on these uh, issues and uh, could deliver us uh, some gadgets, some assets to, to work and to, to deal with. So what can a geographer or a sociologist uh, do or help or to add something to this uh, discussion and uh, to this uh, debate. I think it's the effort 
to generate a kind of transversality that uh, we can connect the knowledge that has been produced in different uh, fields of our uh, actions, of uh, our expertise, of our knowledge, uh, and uh, come up with some explanations that uh, can make a little bit clear why we do certain things and we do not do other things and uh, why certain things take place in one place and uh, in, in not in, 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 in another place. And uh, talking about technology, it is, for me, a very curious question, what is going to be tomorrow? Because as we could see uh, yesterday with the panels we had, or two days ago with the, the movie, uh, we are asking ourselves what can uh, artificial intelligence do in our lives and as a social scientist or a geographer who has you know who have uh, who, who has tried to do some uh, regular research i try to think of the ontology of uh, the scientists themselves because what we are doing now is uh, something very handmade because we have to organize uh, all the phases of a research we have to produce the data we uh, we analyze we have to i don't know to 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 to, de to deliver a kind of uh, uh, group of discourse and analyze it and then deliver the results and now we have such amount of data that we are going to another phase and uh, the ontology of the scientists themselves who try to understand what we do and uh, how we do the things uh, is, is, is being faced by this reality that is controlled at the end, not by governments, but by uh, private companies. Uh, I was not sure if all my colleagues here, other experts, panelists, they were going to perhaps defend Elon Musk, Silicon Valley. I was pretty sure that most of them and most of you here in the room, uh, they were going to be against all these people. And uh, as I am myself, so, but since I realized that from yesterday to today, I thought I need to find out a way to generate little provocations, otherwise I will go there, I will end up saying the same things. So, uh, Elon Musk is devil, uh, these people in Silicon Valley, they are crazy people, they have no idea about life and uh, they are just uh, uh, generating another world that we have to feed. Um, so, I will try to, to deliver just uh, one or two little provocations, not because I disagree with you, but actually because I agree with you. Uh, in, in, in most of the things that I, I have seen uh, uh, in these uh, in this, uh, sessions. Uh, a little provocation, not really, but a little provocation, would be this uh, notion of resilience and the notion of uh, inclusion. Uh, resilience, uh, I remember the first time I worked with the concept was uh, when I was researching uh, climatology and air pollution. So the idea of a resilience was very important because it could show that a system, a, cli cli a system of a climate uh, is resilient because it accepts any kind of input as a pollution and it can recover and to go back to the first state uh, without pollution. Um, and you know, like this kind of studies, you have to work with the zero, uh, zero, zero scales. So you have a micro scale, you have local scale, you have urban scale, you have a regional scale, then you have like a, a mac macro scale. So then you can define if this system is resilient or not to this input that is coming. I'm not sure that the idea of resilience is the appropriate idea to be applied for smart cities. I'm not sure that we have, in our concrete way, in our, in our concrete world, 
the smart city developed as a system that is already in balance and that needs to always come back to this very idealized stage. I don't know if uh, we uh, should be talking about adaption, um, vulnerab vulnerability, of course, is the idea is always there. But for me, and I think this can be discussed, the idea of resilience is not pretty clear because of the, the, the because of the uh, of, of, of the, the the topics uh, or the ideas I, I, I just mentioned, and the other one, and I think this is more provocative than the, the, for, the former one, is the idea of inclusion, because I think the concept of smart cities nowadays already has this essence of inclusion built in. The point is what kind of inclusion it refers to. So, yesterday someone was explaining the origin and the definition of uh, the idea of a smart city. And uh, I think it's uh, pretty clear for everyone here that a smart city is uh, a result or a product of uh, a, a new liberal um, I don't know if you can say consp conspiracy, but the, since we have like a, a company, a big company as IBM, who is promoting the, the, the concept in order to make profits and to have uh, access to the governments and to keep doing their business, I think we can uh, just uh, accept this is a, a pretty new liberal uh, idea. But then it comes into this semantic controversy. Because in English, we can separate smart and intelligence. When we, tra when we, when we, when we uh, translate this concept into another languages, mainly Latin languages, the ones I can, I can say for sure, it is translated into intelligent cities, which is not the same thing. Um, I will talk a little bit further about these, this issue of uh, uh, smart, but I think we have to really connect not as an operational um, concept, but also the semantic connotation, because smart is actually what this ideology, this new liberal ideology tries to promote. I don't think it's really the idea of intelligence, it's really the idea of being smart. You don't need to be intelligent, being smart is enough. Let us see politically what's happening in our world, and uh, if you see United States, for instance, uh, it seems like uh, having a president who is smart is, is, is enough. It's the idea of the opportunism. How can we decide or how something can be decided into a very short-term interest? So I think this is something that differentiates a lot from the idea of uh, intelligence. It's the, 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 the contrast between uh, is smart and uh, intelligence. I will come back to this topic, but I need to leave here the second provocation, and I think this is the, the real provocation here. When we were uh, critically analyzing the idea of a smart city, so uh, the way that you can implement uh, technology, data, uh, and you can manage the resources that uh, are uh, uh, composing uh, the city. It was, I think, uh, always said that the human element was missing, or that humanity was not the center of the idea of smart cities. 
And this is the point I think I can provoke. I do believe that humanity was since the beginning in the very center of the idea of smart cities. Why? Because since we converted everything into economic assets, also human, 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 uh, human uh, acts, human existence, so we talk about human resources, um, Economy itself is a human creation, and that's the main idea. Uh, if we cannot go into this separation, and it goes into epistemology, it goes into practice, and if we cannot recognize this is humanity, when we talk about economy, it's human, it is not in the nature, it was not there given to us. It, it, it is a priority that was built to follow and to make kind of uh, actions for us, so this is, this is the, yeah, this is, this is the, something that I will, I will, go, I will, I will go back to it uh, uh, later on, but it's related to some worries that we have that technology Technology will, will become like humans, and we are not worried about how humans are becoming like machines or turning machines. So I think this, this, this point is very interesting. Uh, when we are worried about uh, if the people who are working, uh, they are lose their jobs because machines are going to do what they could do, I don't think this is a problem at all. I mean, we have faced this in human history. We have faced this through uh, revolutions, industrial revolutions, uh, um, technological revolutions. But the problem itself is when humans start to act as machines. Um, there is a rule or a law that is very famous uh, for people who are researching technology. Uh, which is uh, known as the first law of Kranzberg, and it says that technology is not good, technology is not bad, but technology is also not neutral. Um, this, is, uh, this is something that, uh, together along with other theoretical approaches that actually we are lucky to have them. We are talking about technologies that are pretty new, but I think the, we are lucky to have some experts, some philosophers, some uh, people working on epistemology, some people who are really um, could imagine what was going to happen in our future. They could give us already a kind of a guideline or a kind of roadmap to what could happen in our future. Um, there is a, some, I mean, I, I, I particularly like a lot uh, someone called uh, Peter Sloterdijk, who is a philosopher here uh, in Germany, and uh, he wrote 20 years ago something called uh, The Rules for a Human Park, and uh, it was actually uh, a kind of uh, text to tell us how we would face post-modernity, how we would face uh, what would be the rules that could apply when actually this idea, this previous idea of humanity cannot be applied anymore. So one of the problems we have to face is the idea of humanity itself. Because we are living with technologies, we are living with the gadgets, we are living with a different sort of assets that are determining our subjectivities and uh, they are of course kind of hacking this kind of origin spirit or ethos of humanity. And uh, 
if we do not accept that this very original notion of humanity is over, we might face problems to deliver new rules or to reach a new social contract. Uh, that actually the challenge that we are trying to, uh, to confront in, 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 in our generation. Two things, sorry, two things that I think could help us to think about the things we do, how we do, how do we uh, experience this world as a citizen, a citizen that is uh, influenced and determined by technology and by other artifacts, infra infrastructures, institutions, are the notions of mobility and habitability. And this has been completely changed through technology. First of all, mobility has uh, changed in terms of uh, the ways we move, the ways we can move information, the ways we can move our social roles, the ways uh, we can move also within social structures. And mobility is never alone. Mobility has also its other side, which is the idea of habitability, the way we are and the way we experience this world. And this is always mediated by something. And now, through technology, this is the way that... Uh, two minutes. Okay. We now living in this new social technical uh, environment, I think we have to focus the way we move and the way we are being moved by all these systems and artifacts that actually can uh, influence our decisions, our feelings, our thoughts. And it has also the consequence of affecting the way we are, the way we experience the moments of uh, staying. And the issue of living in a new liberal or in a capitalistic society is that everything is converted into a capital. Mobility is converted into a capital. Habitability is converted into a capital. Elizabeth already told us about Airbnb. This is a way to convert uh, the staying in a capital. It's not, just, uh, it's, it's, it's not just the way people are, but it's how they are paying for that. Uh, it's how they are producing new experiences over that, and so on and so forth. And uh, it happens the very same thing with the mobility. Mobility became a commodity. The same way we have uh, social capital, we have a cultural capital, we have also now uh, a, a capital that is uh, mobile capital. Uh, if you have the capability to move, even if you're not moving, you have more capital uh, than other people who have not capability to move. It can be a passport that you have that accepts your entrance in other, in, other, in other countries, but it can be a driver's license. Or it can be that you have uh, your legs to walk. I will finalize with uh, just uh, two, 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 two things. Uh, I studied for, for, for a few years uh, automobility, and I think uh, automobility as a technology, the automobile cars, they can help us to understand a lot what's happening now and uh, how we can deal at least uh, with our uh, expectations uh, with, uh, new, with new technologies. Um, yesterday, I think uh, someone was asking, I would like to know how the cities in the future will be designed or how they will look like. And if we look at the cities of the future and we see the, future, the cities of now, cars are actually shaping the cities. And cars are shaping not only the cities, cars are shaping our human behavior, cars are shaping our desire, cars are shaping uh, actors in the industry, in governments, cars are shaping all the infrastructure. And this is the infrastructure that actually will become 
a smart city tomorrow, but with much more gadgets, much more uh, elements of control, much more elements uh, of uh, 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 flexibility, it might be, but uh, of course, much more elements of manipulation. And this is, uh, this is, this is the way that uh, it might happen. Cars manipulated us, uh, ICTs manipulate us in a different way, in a different time space, in a different way of uh, generating sociabilities. But it is a very similar way. And if there is something that worries me a lot, is that we were not capable to change this system of automobility. So how can we change now this new system of ICTs uh, companies that are promising us now to take us from, plane, from, 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 from Earth to Mars. Uh, how, can, how can we prevent us, because the effects of these new technologies might be much, much worse than the effects of cars. The deaths that we had uh, just uh, by car crash might be less than the suicides that will happen in the, in the future. Just to give a, a very small example, it's also uh, kind of, well, I don't know, I think not only in, science, in, in, in social sciences, but uh, there is this uh, sentence that was uh, written by uh, Paul Virilio, and he said, well, the, uh, when, when someone uh, invents the ship, someone is also inventing the, the shipwreck, or the, uh, and this is the same with cars, this is the same with, uh, uh, with uh, ICTs, and uh, we, I think, have to work to try to understand what happens as consequences? And this is, I think, our, uh, our goal. Like uh, to show people and to clarify what are the consequences of some behaviors or of certain uh, usages of technologies uh, that the, the, the system uh, of, uh, let us say, the, our, our new liberal uh, uh, world is not, is not really uh, uh, very interesting to show. And just to finalize, I think to succeed in that, zero minutes, and I'm finished, we need to learn how to develop a new regime of discourse, how to generate a new narrative that can break with the old narrative of human beings dominating nature, because the consequence or the First, or the second step of this, of, of this narrative, human beings dominating nature, is that technology dominates human beings. And if we are not capable to take out human beings out of this jail of humanity and mixing them with nature and mixing them with technology, we might end up with the same mistake of domination and of limitations. And I think that was uh, why I wanted to provoke that uh, humanity is already in the center, and humanity is already in the center because we are still not out of these logics of domination, humanity dominating nature and the, tri and, and, and the trap, which is technology dominating human beings. That, that was it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Rafael, for your contribution and also for the few provocations. And I think it's a quite a nice bridge to Alexander's contribution because I think he might also make a start to address this new narrative that we need that you were mentioning. So I hope, Alexander, you can hear us well and that you're fully with us, even though on the screen. So uh, Alexander Monin is the scientific director at Origins Media Lab and also a professor at the ESC Clermont Business School in France. And he's the co-founder of the Closing Worlds Initiative and also heads the new master program Strategy and Design for the Anthropocene with the Strait School of Design in Lyon. Uh, he received his PhD in philosophy from the Pantheon Sorbonne University in Paris and his thesis was dedicated to the philosophy of the web. And recently he also co-edited an issue of Multitudes, which was entitled, Is it too late for collapse? So, um, Alexander, I'm very uh, interested to hear your final part of this panel. 
Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I'm sorry I couldn't be here with you. We have a few uh, problems in some regions of France where I come from. Uh, thanks to the Disruption Network Lab for the invitation and uh, for making it possible for me to uh, nevertheless be here with you. I really wanted to come. I even completed my slides on time, which is a first, uh, but I, I hope uh, my presentation will make up for it. So, um, to begin with, so my presentation is entitled The Defeasibility of Smart Cities. So, to slide two, please. Um, so I, as you said, uh, I did my PhD thesis on the philosophy of the web. I was also for three years a researcher at INRIA, which is the main research, a computer research center in France. This is a kind of French MIT. Um, and while I was working at INRIA, I did ask at some point some uh, colleagues there why they were working on smart cities. And interestingly, no one could answer that question. No one was able to say why has researchers that were dedicating time to that uh, topic. Um, because of course, such programs are not, you know, proposed by researchers, but by big companies. Uh, I've heard about IBM, we could mention Cisco, and of course now uh, lots and lots of other uh, companies as well. Um, yeah. Um, so the, the thing with smart city is uh, smart cities are supposed to solve a lot of issues. Uh, there is Severid's law in the 70s that says the chief source of problems is solutions, uh, meaning that with smart cities, you somehow, somehow aim to solve uh, a problem like making urban areas more resilient. Uh, um, solve the environmental crisis, and blah, blah, blah. But in fact, by aggravating it, um, uh, solving current issues through technology and data management, whereas maybe these issues were uh, caused by technology and data management, among other things, of course. Um, and to do that, uh, and that's my uh, third, sorry, I think it's the third, uh, the third slide. Yes, thank you. Um, you have to um, solve a few issues, uh, like the Jevons paradox and the rebound effect, uh, the problem of optimization, meaning that when you optimize, and smart city is all about optimizing, uh, you end up um, using more energy, more everything. Uh, and that's a problem we have uh, since the Industrial Revolution. It wasn't solved, and we have the same problem this, at the moment in France we have a controversy over 5G because it's supposed to help us uh, uh, fight against the rebound effect, but it is believed that it will in fact fall for the rebound effects. There is the issue of deep coupling growth and environmental impact, having greener technologies, but we now know that decoupling is really hard, even if even it is possible, and a lot of scientific literatures tells us it's not uh, even gonna, it's not possible, it's not gonna happen. There will be no decoupling. Uh, there is also the problem of the so-called dematerialization. Maybe we will decouple with greener technologies because using ICT and smart city, we will uh, somehow dematerialize some of our infrastructure. But again, uh, researchers have been working on that. Uh, you won't see the references, but I will send my entire slides. Uh, and their conclusion is that dematerialization hasn't happened and will not happen in the future. Uh, it's like blo Blockbusters was all about uh, brick and mortar uh, stores. Now there is uh, Netflix instead, but Netflix is 15% of internet uh, energy, uh, traffic and energy. So that is absolutely huge. It's a displacement of materiality. There is no dematerialization. Um, and then there is, of course, the issue with the continuous growth of the environmental impact of um, digital technologies, uh, which, of course, uh, is, is a problem. Uh, it's going to be stronger and stronger in the, in the future. So, um, yeah. Um, I want to show, and that's the uh, next slide, 
uh, an excerpt of uh, a movie. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it. It's a Network by uh, Cinelomet, um, an ID by uh, Paddy Chayevsky. Um, maybe you can, uh, we can see the uh, excerpt of this little film and uh, I, I will be able to comment on it uh, after that. Maybe you can start at one minute and uh, uh, 40 seconds, if it's possible. I don't think we have the film here, unfortunately, do we? No. So oh, okay. I think we so have to that's not on. a problem. I will comment on it. No Maybe problem. I will comment it. on it. So, yes, sure, sure. So it's um, it's an excerpt when you hear Ned Betty talking to the main protagonist of the movie, and he explains him that the world is no longer uh, a world of nations. It's no longer a world of people. It's not even it's no longer of human beings, but it's more it's a world interconnected cybernetic uh, systems. It's not using the word cybernetic, but this is really what it is describing. And uh, what is really interesting is which, when you look at this uh, excerpt uh, dating from the 70s um, and compare it to the discourse over a smart city, maybe you can show the next slide so that I can comment on that. Uh, the next slide is about um, it's a talk by former IBM CEO um, on a smarter planet, I, if I remember well. And the thing is, in the uh, movie ex extract I wanted to show, uh, the, 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 the uh, Ned Betty character is talking about um, corporate cosmology. And this corporate cosmology basically is a cosmology of systems. It's a cybernetic cosmology. And now that we have all this discourse uh, and more than that about smart city, smart city is supposed to be uh, revolutionizing our way of looking at things. But my take is it's not uh, revolutionary at all. It's really business as usual. Uh, when you compare two discourses, uh, it's really they're really similar. Of course, um, the, 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 the movie extract wasn't an exact description of what was happening at the time. It was also projection. But I mean, the cybernetic elements in both of these discourses and that are so prevalent when we are describing the smart city uh, means that we, we, we're dealing with tradition, which is a post-World War II uh, tradition, which is changing a bit. Uh, there are more digital elements. Uh, some of the technologies are changing, but the cosmology has uh, basically remained the same. And I think it's appropriate to call that cosmology Corporate cosmology. So instead of looking at smart cities as being revolutionizing everything, even being innovative, I'd say they are business as usual and they somehow, for that reason, belong to the past. And this is something I would uh, talk about for the remaining of my presentation. Um, yeah, there was a, a nice paper uh, entitled by Orit uh, Halper and Robert Mitchell and uh, Bernard Gehogehan, um, we, uh, the smartness mandate. And they say, advocates of smartness see opportunities to decentralize agency and intelligence by distributing. Oh. I think we should have gone to the next slide maybe already. Yes, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> and so they say, uh, um, let's see, uh, smartness has opportunities to decentralize agency and intelligence by distributing it among objects, networks, and life forms. And this is this very idea of how there is this cosmology, corporate cosmology that is uh, 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 going everywhere. Uh, that's uh, something important. I think. Sure. Um, so, with smart cities, we can say that this cosmology, this corporate cosmology, extends to cities themselves. Uh, they become firms, they have competitors, 
and they rely on the same infrastructures as corporations do, uh, which is a huge transformation of how what city used to be, uh, really. Um, why solutions won't work here? Uh, because the problem of digital technologies, which Smart City is a part of, is, no, is not an ac accidental but an essential uh, problem. There is the rebound paradox that won't go away. Uh, and the fact that uh, um, physicists in France called José Roy calls uh, digital technologies zombie technologies, and they essentially are zombie technologies, something I will explain in a moment. And the fact that decoupling is nigh on impossible, meaning that we already know that smart cities won't solve the problems they are supposed to solve, because those problems cannot be solved by technological, even infrastructural solutions. About zombie technologies, I can say just a few words. Uh, so this physicist explains that zombie technologies are basically uh, technologies that are not uh, based on renewables. There are technologies for which objects, technological objects, uh, become obsolete in no time. And that, on the other hand, produce, um, how should I say, uh, junk uh, that stays for a very long time, that somehow stays alive. So whence the idea that these are zombie technologies, they, they do not know how to die. They produce new geological strata and things like that. And we have to deal with them for a very, very long time because they are not well uh, immersed in um, uh, uh, biogeochemical uh, cycles and processes. Uh, so why solutions won't work? Uh, I've, I've, environmental issues are not merely a byproduct but an integral part of the model. Um, they're not negative externality, but a necessity. Yet with smart cities and techno fixes uh, in general, they fit well within the model of global governance of climate issues. More and more parties are taking up climate issues like cities, like corporations. At their level, without tackling fundamental issues of growth, the extraction and use of fossil fuel and the lights. And why is that? Uh, because something that a German uh, politicist, Stefan Eikut, who's been uh, working in France uh, for quite some time, in his last book published this year, entitled The Climatization of the World, um, he explains that the model of global governance regarding climate issues is based on so-called end of pipe measures that we try to regulate outputs and therefore uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, but international negotiations will therefore mainly concern the distribution of the global effort to reduce emission. On the other hand, we will not tackle the question of inputs in the processes that determine the evolution of, of emissions such as energy production, industrial development models, or the funding of the world economy. And this is why we are relying on techno fixes, because on the one hand, we have institutions that foster growth, and on the other hand, we have institutions that try to decarbonize the economy. But uh, you have strategical institutions on the one hand, and tactical institutions on the other hand. And a tactical uh, answer to the, these problems is innovation, and among these innovations, you can count smart cities. But as I said, for various reasons that will not do uh, intrinsically and also because it's a way of not tackling the real issues at hand. Um, I would say the problem also is not the solution. Going back to technology and philosophical discussions about technology which we heard about during the last talk, uh, I will say about uh, the late Bernard Stigler's theory of pharmacon, meaning both the cure and the poison. Uh, the late Bernard Stiegler and the Internation Collective wrote about smart cities in the last book he published entitled Bifurqué uh, in French. Uh, against technophobic trends, they insisted on the importance of uh, technology just as Stiegler did uh, for his entire life. But technology is different from technologies. One can oppose zombie technologies, including smart cities, and yet refuse to embrace a technophobic uh, position. That's why technodiversity matters. Making distinction between different kinds of technologies is extremely important in those debates. There is not just 
technology in the singular. Uh, the technical system or technical systems, but in singular, the technical system is thought to be disrupting the social, economic, legal, and the likes systems, as if it was always in advance. That's why it's so disruptive. But this time, we may say it's not in advance, but rather out of sync with the current situation. We probably do not have the means for these technologies, for these infrastructures in the time of uh, the Anthropocene. So we might think of these technologies as backwards and not forwards looking. The IoT, for example, the Internet of Things, dates back from the 80s. Smart cities appeared in 2005, and we know that these perspectives, I said, do not fit well with, you may call it the Anthropocene, the impending collapse, the ecological med meltdown, or the coming, uh, the looming extinction. The smart city is thus a good example of what I call obsolete futures. Futures which are obsolete as soon as they become extant. Uh, innovations that are 40 years old, and now that they are arriving, we already know that they are entirely obsolete and will not problems of our times. Maybe they could solve, I doubt so, but uh, uh, problems that we had 40 years ago, but they will certainly not solve the problems of our times. Uh, I did put on my bigger slides some references about the uh, uh, looming consequences, so you'll be able to uh, see what they uh, entail. Um, some issues. Ernest Stigler, for example, takes for granted that smart cities will happen. But no attention is given to movements of resistance and tactics deployed to shut down some project like Keyside in Toronto, which was in the summer. From a strategic perspective now, not just tactical perspective, no effort is dedicated to synchronizing the scenario of the smart city with what we know about the trajectory of the Earth system in the Anthropocene. This is where I develop my uh, notion of the negative commons. The neg negative commons is a concept I uh, propose um, to uh, somehow understand the transformation of the commons inside Anthropocene, meaning to be very brief that we will not just inherit resources that everyone wants to appropriate, whence the issue of the commons and how we can avoid that, how we can avoid the so-called tragedy of the commons, maybe was never really a, a thing in history, uh, but pro of course an ideological discourse. Uh, with the negative commons, the issue is more how we can inherit um, polluted soils, uh, nuclear plants, uh, obsolete technologies and obsolete futures, that kind of thing. How we can inherit them democratically and what we do about them. Do we have to live with them? Do we have to dismantle them? And how we do that democratically and by the people. That's the topic of negative commons. And I would say smart city being something already obsolete and we knew it would be obsolete uh, is somehow a negative commons that we are inheriting right now and we must learn how to inherit it. So with uh, a colleague, Diego Landiva, we um, indeed, uh, and that's a slide, uh, that's the next slide, slide six, uh, we launched the Closing Worlds Initiative, which is basically all about, uh, I think it's the slide before, but anyway, it's uh, uh, the Closing Worlds Initiative, which is uh, um, uh, an initiative about how we may both inherit existing infrastructures uh, and how we can and learn what we can do with them, how we can, and at the same time, um, make innovations not happen. Uh, as I said, obsolete innovations not happen because most of the innovations we have right now and we will have in the foreseeable future is uh, obsolete uh, innovation. So we have to learn to uh, avoid it uh, becoming extant. And that is something we, don't, we do not know, really. Uh, there, are no, there are no courses about that. And we want to remedy that with the master degree that has been mentioned, uh, strategy and design for the Anthropocene. So there were two directions, avoiding innovations to come to existence, 
and dismantling existing technologies, infrastructures unfit for the time to come. And we're currently helping a city of more than 100,000 inhabitants to foreclose some of its infrastructures with democratic protocols of renunciations that call for broader transformations. Um, onto the slides and the title, looking at pressing issues for cities, I think you saw it, but uh, you can think about smart cities and think, okay, we have some issues, let's invest in uh, smart everything to solve them. But the problem is that we, we already have a problem for cities, even cities that are not smart. Cities will face issues of food security, rising sea levels, extreme heat, sometimes deadly heat, problems of access to water. And regarding all these problems, I'm really not sure uh, smart city will not agree with them and certainly will not solve these issues. So we do not even know if there will be cities in the futures, let alone smart cities. So we might not go in the right direction there. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a new illustration of that. It's a schema that represents that just for France, because I'm French, sorry, but uh, the issues that cities in the future uh, 2050 will face. So extreme heat, uh, uh, problems of, as I said, uh, flood uh, and the likes. So uh, are we sure that the developments we are projecting on smart city are compatible with those developments uh, which are much more scientific? That's, that's a question. Uh, meanwhile, in France, in Grenoble, uh, once a place where smart city was first implemented, um, Grenoble is looking to ban 5G with um, a host of other cities in France. So there is a collective movement to question the need to have these so-called progresses. And it's not just about Luddits, but it's even on the side of institutions asking whether that or not. So there is a huge fight going on in France where President Macron called those against 5G uh, uh, he likened them to Amish people, which was kind of a racist remark, but uh, anyway. So how about smart cities to conclude uh, somehow? I'd say that as jokes, they should be ridiculed. As dystopias, they should be seriously fought. As projects, we should use them to learn how to shut down innovations. And as realities, we should learn how to inherit them as ruins. They are ruins of the past. They are not the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alexander. I don't know if you could hear that there was quite a long applause from the audience, so very well received talk. And I'm sure it will bring up also some additional questions for the Q&A. Uh, so before we move on to the audience, I just have a, a question also for the other speakers of tonight. So I wanted to ask you, Elizabeth, in light of your work on the Digital Cities Alliance and the Berlin Digital Strategy, if you could uh, talk a bit about how maybe, hopefully, the view of these developments have changed since the coronavirus pandemic. So suddenly, of course, people had to work from home and there was an increased focus on digitalization, like you also mentioned. And seeing your slides of how the politics is structured, I envision it won't happen too fast, but maybe have you seen some positive developments or a new outlook on, on the digital in Berlin? Yeah, that's uh, an interesting question. We had uh, the, the alliance, actually, we met up sometime in April, May to try to, to, to collect some learnings that we were seeing uh, during the lockdown and also to try to reflect them into what, what do we need, what kind of uh, digital policy do we need. And we see, like, um, I mean, there are several dynamics in this. One is that everybody was very quickly digitalized, of course, and uh, even, um, even school systems and administrations realize that they do lack something if they don't have computers. Uh, and they do lack something if their uh, 
uh, employees uh, or their staff don't have computers that they can take home, which was a huge problem in Berlin. And uh, a lot of, of Berlin's um, public service was pretty much put on hold for some months because everybody was sent home and nobody had a, a computer that could, they could work with. But um, it also showed, of course, the huge digital divide that still exists today with everybody all children being sent home to do some kind of online homeschooling and just not realizing that we do live in an unequal society where not everybody has uh, internet access, not everybody has any access to digital uh, devices and if there is a digital device in the home it's a smartphone which you cannot use. So this question was also very big. I think it made the question of digitalization very relevant for the administration I wonder whether, or I wonder in what form they realized what kind of societal implications it means and how they have to deal with that and not just say, oh wow, we take this chance and digitalize every, everything because that's not solving the problem because the problem comes before. Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, and then for Rafael, I wanted to ask you now, uh, as a sociologist, as you said, um, do, you, do you maybe see any things that we also can learn uh, from the history of cities that we could use to shape the cities of the future, sort of take, take with us from the past, not to end in a too negative note? Uh, the reason for cities to exist is that they are a way to optimize space, they are a way to maximize our contacts, and they are a way to minimize efforts and energy. Um, I think the concept, the idea is, is pretty fine. Uh, the problem is when it has to uh, merge with uh, the uh, current ideolo ideology that is actually the leading and hegemonic in, in, our, in our culture, which is uh, sometimes even to produce problems, to produce waste, because these will mean uh, power concentration, it will mean consumption, it will mean... So um, the, the, the idea, the notion of the city itself, I think it's pretty fine. I think our, our, the, the, the goal that we all have is how to fix the patterns, the values uh, uh, that uh, actually are designing our behavior and uh, technology has uh, a lot to do uh, with that, with, uh, with, with any doubt. So if we, if we think of uh, uh, optimizing space, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty fine. We want also to produce a, a good quality of sociability. This is very important. And uh, the problem that the future and the, the present is, uh, is already putting as a challenge is energy. Um, so, and this is pretty sure that uh, our current model will not solve this, and we have to fight for a new one. All right, thank you. And then the first question for Alexander, I think there will be for sure many more. Um, what do you think, uh, based on the research you're doing also with your group on around the Anthropocene, uh, what are your thoughts on the recent developments, of course, around the coronavirus pandemic, and how this influenced the, the future of smart cities, or if this will change anything, maybe accelerate certain developments or make people more aware of certain aspects? What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's uh, actually, I think what was interesting uh, during that crisis is that it showed somehow uh, the, the, the limits of this uh, corporate cosmology I've been talking about, uh, meaning that if you attach the subsistence of people to corporations, and everything, everything stops, well, for some people, because there were a lot of people for whom uh, uh, nothing did stop. They were over, over, uh, continuously working, taking risks and, and the likes. But for a lot of people, uh, they, they, they couldn't uh, work anymore. And uh, it was their subsistence that was at, at risk. So we have this system where if infrastructure is put to a halt, if the international commerce is put to a halt, there are a lot of people who are going to... Uh, to die. And at the same time, we're attached to these infrastructures, as I just said, um, and, and the coronavirus crisis made that very obvious uh, for those who would doubt it. But at the same time, these infrastructures, these models 
uh, are also killing us in the middle and long run. So we have this uh, perspective that we are uh, immediately attached to infrastructures, models, and the likes um, for our subsistence. But in the longer run, this subsistence is put at risk by these same infrastructures, technologies, and all. So this is why it's a very paradoxical situation and very difficult one to address, but still that the situation we're in and the coronavirus crisis made this apparent. All right, then we still have some time left also for questions from the audience. So I see you ready to one day. Uh, yeah, thanks for all of the talks. Um, Alexander, your, your language uh, really resonated with me and it made me wonder if we can use language to think in terms of our resistance, forms of resistance, like thinking in terms of the extinction of greedy motherfuckers, the extinction of corporate culture, the extinction of exploitation, uh, capitalism. And in doing that, I think, I tried to point this out yesterday, that I think it's really good to think in terms of making our uh, neighborhoods and our communities incompatible with the, the dead smart cities. So um, with Elizabeth's sort of approach to organizing the, the Keats in Berlin, uh, we've had some success with that and how we uh, resist um, the, the corporate culture. And I think we can inspire ourselves to think about how, how we can continue in that mode because the smart cities are actually being made to contain resistance. I think it's one of the, the biggest agendas of the surveillance state and the, um, yeah, the, the, the smart interconnected overwatching kind of culture. So uh, if any of you can reflect on some, some things, we can move on to protect ourselves from, from these horrible corporate plans. Maybe you could say just something. Uh, um, yes, uh, regarding uh, language, um, I feel you're right, and we are actually uh, dealing with this as working with an artist who unfortunately died during the, the summer, but we are trying to, uh, how should I say, uh, to hear uh, language. And, and for example, we talk about this innovation uh, shutting things down and expressions that people do not have. Our business model basically uh, inside the Closing World Initiative is to ask corporations to give us money to shut them down, uh, uh, which might seem uh, uh, funny, but this is really what we're doing and with some, uh, some success. Because I think that now there, there are opportunities to um, weave new alliances with people who might not be militants, who might not have a political culture, but that increasingly, uh, because of the scientific alerts, because of the IPCC, because of lots of signs that people can grasp, um, there is somehow, um, what should I say, uh, uh, turning up against, uh, for example, the corporations where they work, lots of engineers, Years right now, especially in France with the collapse movement, which is really strong, are against some technologies. Lots of CEOs are bosses uh, during the day and uh, people who believe in collapse uh, during the night interviewed uh, some of those. So there are new political lines which are not the, 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 the ones that were dividing people in the past. And we should yeah, try to, to, to work with um, these people, for example, in France, Orange, Orange uh, the big ICT company, has had um, engineers sending a note internally um, requesting that 5G uh, uh, would not be done uh, and giving arguments against uh, uh, going so far into doing 5G and then the smart city. So those are interesting signs and call for, as I said, new uh, alliances. If maybe if there's another question, otherwise I could comment uh, as well. I think this is also, especially when you're working with very local politics as you are in a municipal level, it becomes very interesting because it, you, you get access to the politicians and the, and the administrators in these um, departments. 
and, and we have uh, had a lot of conversations with people in these three um, administrations now for the last couple of weeks trying to talk about this round table, for example. And there it becomes a big daunting task to talk about these issues or to, to, to even start uh, putting up that language because they, they are people that are not there yet. They are people that are um, like trying not to work digitally at all, that are trying, like the, the level of, of um, understanding of the issues in mainstream culture and of course also in these administrations is not there yet. And I think this is the, the, when we talk about what kind of competence do we need to build up now, for example, in Berlin in these administrations, it could be technical competence, sure. But I think it's another kind of competence that we need to, to build up. And I think this is also where we can come in as civic, uh, civil society actors to say, these issues are not technical issues. Like for example, during this um, digital strategy process, all, of, all administrations were sent an, a questionnaire on Excel, by the way, and everybody sent it, or not everybody, but a lot of administrations just sent it to the IT guy. So what does the Berlin digital strategy mean? Let's ask the IT guy, maybe he knows. So this is the level where we're standing at right now. And this is, we should see it as, a, 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 as also the perfect moment because then we're all pretty much in the same room. We are all getting aware at the same time. And I think this is um, yeah, really important right now. I think there was another question there in the middle. Hi, um, thank you all for your talks. Um, there was something that Alexander said that about like differentiating between good and bad technology. Um, in many activist circles, I've meet a lot of friends and comrades and who, who say, you know, oh, technology, all oh, burn it down, oh, we hate it. And I sometimes agree, but I'm also a technologist. So maybe if each of you could say like just one thing you would maybe identify as a good and a bad technology for a better future, I would be really curious. Oh, that's a great question. Who wants to start? <laughs> maybe Alexander? No, 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 please go, please go. I will, I have to say something, but. Or reflecting for a moment. <laughs> no, I can, okay. Uh, so um, I, I, I mentioned uh, zombie technologies and uh, living technologies. So uh, as zombie technologies are uh, built on uh, renewable resources, living technologies will be built on renewable resources, which is not necessary, but uh, a, a good thing will will last for uh, quite a long time and will not become zombie uh, waste, meaning waste that cannot disappear, that cannot die, uh, just like uh, ICT. ICT cannot die because we're using uh, ore, we're using metal, we're using a lot of things that are not part of any um, cycle. Uh, uh, bio uh, uh, chemical uh, cycle. So uh, for living technologies, for example, will be a, a, a good technology, but that's not the only criteria. If I advocate for technical diversity, that's just not to push for one kind of uh, technology. Uh, there are lots of debates in France, at least, around low tech, uh, which is maybe not characterized in a nice way, but it um, pushes forward the ideas of reparability, of understanding the uh, uh, um, technologies not like black boxes, but being able to interact with it. So all these aspects uh, are, are better than those that we uh, mainly have right now. Yeah, Udo, maybe um, join that. I mean, I, as I said right in the beginning, I uh, built urban gardens for 10 years. So this is a type of technology building or reconnecting to technology that has left our societies, especially in the urban realm, and that we need to reconnect to. But I think it's difficult because obviously you're not meant, you were not thinking about that kind of technology, I'm guessing. <laughs> but. Um, but of course, a lot of digital technology is great, right? Like we are just living the Jetson family here. Like 
I was watching that as a child, that you could uh, talk with people over the phone with FaceTime. It, it, this is pretty cool. But I think these are uh, the criteria that are, like, as fast as you put that in the light of climate crisis and climate catastrophe, then all of that becomes irrelevant because it's just nice to have. But of course it's great that we can uh, communicate and theoretically democ democratize uh, information. But uh, well, how do you put that in the perspective of climate change? Um, I would insist in, 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 in this uh, case of uh, technology is also merging with us and it's uh, always creating a new kind of social roles, a new kind of subjects. So when you create a car, you are also creating the driver, you are also creating the passenger, you are also creating the pedestrian that already existed but not into this framework. Um, so um, I, I think for us, the it's, it's, it, it's, I, I feel good when a technology can help me to understand uh, what is behind uh, all these complex uh, connections. So, and I think it's bad when it just turns our relations much more opaque and uh, unseen. Uh, so if we can use technology to uh, just uh, to make things much more transparent, to show us the consequences of our acts and also to uh, improve uh, the liability that we, we, we can have on institutions mainly because uh, since uh, the level of complexity is uh, increasing so much, uh, the idea of individual, only individual freedom will not be enough. So we need to rely on institutions and I think technology will have also a very important uh, role uh, institutionally. Thank you. Uh, there's another question here in the front. Maybe more later, but there's a microphone on the way. Ah. Great. Hi. Um, I was, uh, would like to comment on the experience with people in the government in Berlin. I was in the beginning of the year on an event also on smart cities, and there was Elke Plate. Uh, she works in the government for uh, the city development and living, and I was able to ask her a question about the uh, influence on digital products in our uh, city. And um, I linked the question to uh, the update on Google Maps a few, year, few years ago, where they introduced um, point of interest areas that are colored orange and that have uh, influence on our city. And I uh, asked if there is a connection or do um, if they are in uh, conversation with Google. And she said, no, there is no uh, conversation about that. And um, when I uh, imagine myself uh, asking the Senate to plant flowers in front of my home, it uh, takes four permissions and a half year to get uh, this going. And um, it seems that the government um, just reacts on uh, the, the changes of um, um, digital platforms and products and they are not, um, they are they're just reacting on it and it seems they have a strong authority on physical layer of the city but they have no uh, authority, authority on the digital layer of our city. Um, I don't, I, I don't uh, get it. <laughs> uh, I don't know how we uh, proceed with smart cities if uh, the government uh, has no authority on this digital layer of our city and um, yeah, that was uh, just coming to my head <laughs> as you mentioned it. Yeah, thank you. Would you like to comment? Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, that's pretty much the problem, no? I think this is about, it's also about like a cultural shift and of, un, of making government understand that whether or not they understand what's going on, they have to stand in our corner and protect us as a society. This is, this is their job. So they have to get up to par right now to have these discussions and also start being like they're being pretty provocative and radical when it comes now to, to the built layer of buying houses of saying we need to take back control of, of the buildings and infrastructures to be able to enforce our, our power <laughs> to, to, for the to, to uh, 
uh, towards uh, social justice, for example, the same way they have to start thinking about the digital. And this was an example with the Airbnb thing or with these scooters, for example, where they're just pretty much lying on their backs and saying like, oh, we, uh, uh, sure, they can come. It's like in innovation. They have, we have to be open for this, especially because Berlin is trying to prof prof profile itself as a smart city, as a smart city, as a startup city. I mean, it, there's a lot of venture capital here and so many startups. So, I mean, they're, they're doing a lot of work to, to put on that image as well. But I think we have to make them understand that they're standing in the wrong corner at the moment and they have to, yeah, they have to take on the role to shape the digital. They have to build up these resources now. They have to open the door for the people that exist in, these, in this city that have the know-how, have the capacity to, to come in with knowledge if they're not able to build it up themselves, I think. And, and of course, just one thing, smart city strategy, right? It's in the mayor's office. It's supposed to be a smart city for a sustainable, resilient city planning. Where is city planning in this? Like the, the administration of the city planning has to, should be part of this conversation. Same as the Senate for, for Environment has to be sitting at this table. Otherwise we are making policy that is not related to these two objectives. So I think this is also, we have to break through these silos also on an administrative level. Do we have more questions from the audience? I think one here in the front, or do you have the microphone? Yes, I try with mine, it's working, yes. Um, so, thanks uh, to all of you for your presentations. Also, thanks, Alexandra, we don't see each other, but <laughs> I also really enjoy your presentation and uh, I have to tell you also the public was really clapping a lot. So, I mean, we will meet in the future, but the future is already here with you on TV, so. <laughs> but I had actually, uh, one question for um, Elizabeth and one question for Raphael. And uh, I think actually my point is to take the provocation of Raphael because <laughs> I think it was also directed to me since I did the title of this panel. And by the way, I'm also a sociologist, so we can have an interesting <laughs> battle. <laughs> but I don't want to go too much in detail of that. Um, so my question would be uh, not I don't want to much speak about the discourse of resilient city, but more about uh, the discourse of inclusive uh, cities and inclusion, because since you also work a lot on the topic of habitability, I wonder how you could consider um, the future of the cities related to habitability without inclusion. So I still believe that this concept is important and um, perhaps you want to comment on that. And then instead with Elizabeth, I have kind of concrete question because you were saying that uh, the plan of the cities of Berlin, a smart city, starts in 2015, if I understood. So I would like to understand a bit better what, why in 2015, what was the plan uh, that they had uh, in that moment and what is going to change uh, towards the future. Uh, I know also through your group you are having a dialogue with policymakers. Maybe you can tell us a bit more of what they are answering to you. Okay. Um, the, uh, Tatiana, thank you. No, the idea was, uh, the, the program is great. I think I had just to, to, to do that little provocation because the inclusion in this sense, uh, on the idea of a smart city, uh, inclusion has to occur because you need to include everyone as a consumer and uh, that happens and uh, this is uh, either uh, because you pay something or uh, because you are giving your data. So um, we, we can take a Uber here, we can order a food and uh, the, the, the professional, the guy working there, he will uh, receive his, his money for his job but uh, partially for the job because actually he is uh, data mining, uh, his, da his data mining and for this part of the job he's receiving nothing. Um, so, uh, but he, he has been included. Uh, so yes, it was only the, uh, the, the, the provocation because we are not being included as citizens. No? And that's, uh, I, I think, uh, the, 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 dis the discussion. Uh, but then we also have to move the discussion from a smart city into something else because the idea of a smart city is that one, is to include you 
As I wanted to know about habitability. And the habitability is also within uh, these, uh, this idea of a smart city uh, is uh, the uh, economy of attention. So if uh, you are not moving the way you have to, to inhabit it, uh, a place, it has to be related in to any kind of consumption. It is your uh, attention that's been consumed or it is uh, the way you are paying for a place to leave or a place to stay. We had the case of Airbnbs happening, uh, people being actually uh, pushed out of uh, the cities. And uh, it is always uh, to relate to this uh, logics of, uh, of, 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 of the financial market. Uh, what they do nowadays is not only to, 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 to sell things and to buy things, they are actually selling things that do not belong to them or they are selling things that do not even exist. And within these logics, everything falls in. Uh, mobility, the way uh, we have to expect that uh, uh, autonomous cars will be our future. But then while you are moving, you're at the same time inhabiting uh, a place, which is the car, and uh, they might uh, be showing you some kind of uh, uh, publicity, trying to, to sell something, or just uh, collecting your data to understand the patterns of, uh, of, of mobility. And uh, so this is, uh, uh, this is a kind of uh, uh, the coin with two sides. So you have mobility, but you always have uh, any kind of, uh, you have to inhabit it, this, uh, the, the space. So, uh, if we are talking about smart city, within the framework of a smart city, it, it will be always trying to transform yourself or your behavior, your present, your past or your future into any kind of a product. It will be commercialized anyway to you. Yeah, and to your question to smart city strategy, yeah, it was uh, written 2015. I have not looked into that strategy process so closely as the other, um, as the digital strategy process. But when you read the document, it feels like it was something that Berlin had to do to not like pass, the, like to, to not miss the bus and not, not have a, a smart city strategy. But when you read it, it's actually just a collection of very eclectic different projects that could be called smart. Um, because they have sensors in them, and then saying that this is the smart city strategy. But it wasn't, there was no implementation plan, there was no operative plan, there were no indicators to say what is good, what is bad. So I think everybody agrees also uh, in an ad, in, within the administrations that it was not a well-made uh, strategy. And now with these 17 and a half million uh, euros, they want to renew the strategy and they're saying that they want it to be very participatory and so on and so forth. Um, and we will see how this process goes, I think. Uh, they will, um, we were speaking yesterday, uh, yesterday, yeah, yesterday with um, uh, Staatssekretär Negle, I don't know what this title is in English, um, but uh, at the mayor's office. Secretary of State. Yeah, Secretary of State. Of, the, of, of Berlin's mayor's office, who has, um, who is the, the person leading this smart city endeavor, and he's very upfront with that Berlin is very far behind uh, on very key issues. For example, he was saying that um, that when we are uh, speaking about uh, um, data governance and and these issues, we have a lot of work to do. But he is very open towards this to become a participatory process that this has to do about uh, this is a city planning issue and not a technological issue. So he was saying a lot of the right things and I think now we have the possibility to take him for his word on this and, and make sure that, that this process is something that we can live with. And I think the language problem is big. I think it's a difficulty to call something a smart city strategy just because you have to call it that if that's not what you want to do. Like, ah, we're doing smart city strategy, but we're not meaning all of these bad things, we're meaning the good things, then let's call it something else, probably. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. I think we're about at the end of the time for today, but I would also still like to mention, so the smart city strategy of Berlin may not be too, too great, but tomorrow, we will actually do a workshop together with you to create our own kind of citizen manifesto for what we want, the type of city in the future, type of data city we want to live in. So 
Um, that will be also very interesting to do tomorrow. But first, thanks a lot for the panel of today and for this great closing of our Data City conference. So uh, one more applause for you all. And then, uh, yeah, we'll call you off stage and then Alexander and then Tatiana can join me for the final closing of our event. <laughs> by Alexander. <laughs> <laughs> so we won't be too long because I think now is late, but as the tradition we usually have, we want to conclude the conference stream with uh, some announcements uh, for the next activities and also the day of tomorrow. Come a bit closer, otherwise we are always not with in the... the <laughs> yes. that I don't know if long enough, uh, but I think it will work. <laughs> yes. And uh, so we will announce what happens next and then also what happens in November. Uh, and we will finish with the thanks to all the people that worked here. So I pass it to you to describe what happens tomorrow. Yeah, so like I already briefly said, there will be some workshops happening tomorrow. So tomorrow is actually the closing day of the Data Cities event, which is the day focus on the community. So it comes out of our activation community program. And on this day, we will focus on getting hands-on with the topic and also learning from some of the people that have been speaking at the event uh, in a more workshop format. And we will open the day with an artist talk by Simon Weckert on his Google Maps Hacks project. And also for this talk, even if you're not joining the workshops later, we still have some free spots. So feel free to come by tomorrow from 2.30, we will start. And then we will continue in the afternoon with four uh, workshops. Uh, smash your filter bubble with tracking exposed, visualizing control on critical mapping with River Honer, who spoke also yesterday at the conference, uh, a workshop on reuse, recycling and repair with Philippe Fonseca, and finally the workshop with Elisabeth on shaping the manifesto for the future data city. And then at the end we will come back to share our experiences and outcomes from all of these four workshops. Then um, I just wanted to announce what is happening next. Of course, now it's very difficult to speak about the future of events, even if we are speaking about the cities of the future, but we don't know what will happen in two months. Um, we are planning our next conference uh, the last weekend of November. So let's see what will happen in our pandemic uh, situation. Uh, but uh, so far, uh, we are planning it here again. Then we have to understand uh, who could join and how many people we can invite. But uh, this will be our hybrid concept of development. And uh, this conference is called Borders of Fear uh, and is about migration, security and control. So we want it to, from the Disruption Network Lab point of view uh, to analyze the discourse of migration, but also of security connected with the closure of borders. Uh, and uh, from one side, uh, there is an aspect of closure of frontiers, also creation of refugee camps uh, and escalation of security. At the other side, there is also a strategy of cultural closure that is related to right-wing propaganda um, in, and the idea of increasing surveillance uh, and nationalism uh, related to migration. So uh, this is not an easy topic. Uh, we never really went into it, so directly to, uh, the Disruption Network Club, but we really think is the time to speak about um, and understand this topic as well. Um, so the dates will be November 27, 28, and then again we will do the, uh, no, sorry, 27, 28, yes, and the 29, um, we will do another day of a workshop with Lieke. Uh, so the idea is always to then conclude with uh, uh, an event that is related to the communities. Uh, but now uh, we want also to conclude with our thanks. And first of all, I want to thank all the speakers that came uh, and uh, Mauro Mondello that is hopefully still watching us yes. online that has been curating the conference with me, but is in US 
trapped there. Oh. <laughs> no, not really trapped, but uh, I mean, he's actually doing great things. He has a world uh, fellowship at Yale, but at the moment, uh, apparently, if you go to US, it's very difficult to go out. So he could not come to the conference that he also worked with. Um, and uh, I want to thank uh, our production team that did a really great work. Elena Velianoska, Nada Bakker, and Monty Harmony, and uh, Jonas Franke for the design, uh, design that, and visual and all the great animations that you saw in these days, and Steph Lenk for the communication. Thanking and the rest uh, of the crew, and maybe you want to do, otherwise yes, I'm just speaking alone. Definitely, so we want to thank our great video team, which is Gonzalo, Gabriel, and Angel, which have been filming all the talks, which we will then also upload later to our archive on YouTube. And of course, a really big thanks to Rana Vadikari, who is taking care of the streaming from the Boiling Head Media. Yeah, was and he really work. did a great job <laughs> this time. It was quite challenging, but he managed very well. So many thanks also to you, Rana. Uh, then we want to thank Ricardo Bernardi, who did the photograph for this event. And also Elisabeth Enke, Francesco Mancori, and Thurston Utken, who did the support for the technology. And finally, we want to thank Kim Sanu, even though she already left, but she was helping us at the cash desk and also assistant event management. And then also thanking uh, Jasper and Guillermo who helped us for the setup and the takedown. So thanks to everyone. And then thank you, Lee. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Tatiana. <laughs> and uh, we will meet tomorrow at 2.30 for the continuation. Yes, hope to thank see you. many of you there.